As sports history fans, we often reminisce about the legends. Willis Reed limping on to the NBA Finals Court, Kurt Schilling's bloody sock, Kerry Strug's courageous dismount, and so many more. These moments often define sports history. But what about the countless injuries that did not become legends or careers that were derailed due to inadequate care? That's where this episode sponsor comes in. Introducing to you, ILP Sports Consultants, your trusted sports injury partner available 24-7. Brian Maelli at ILP Sports Consultants has over 20 years of experience in the orthopedic and sports medicine industry, and he has worked with athletes across the gamut, from youth to amateurs, professionals, in almost every sport played in the United States of America, accommodating athletes at every stage of their career. This adaptability ensures that ILP services are perfectly tailored to your skill level, no matter where you are in your athletic journey. With ILP, you are in control. Choose the steps that matter most to you. Diagnosis, treatment plan, recovery, or the whole journey. ILP services are tailored to your unique needs. Rushing for care is a common pitfall leading to future problems. ILP Sports Consultants helps you make the right decisions, ensuring that you receive timely and safe care. And here's a bonus. Brian hosts the Injured List podcast, sharing insights and athlete stories you won't want to miss. Whether you're a concerned parent or grandparent or an athlete yourself seeking guidance, ILP Sports Consultants is your beacon of hope in sports injury management. Visit ILPSports.com today. That's the letters ILP Sports.com. ILP Sports Consultants, where your well being is the priority and your recovery is the mission. Choose ILP Sports Consultants for a healthier sports journey, helping you get back in the game the smart way. Blog Talk Radio. Season pass when 22 men graced the rugged fields of yesterday, fighting for one more first down, one more yard gain, one final score which would bring victory after 60 minutes of battle on the gridiron. Tonight, we'll explore the world of gridiron greats. Welcome to Gridiron Greats Football History and its memorabilia on the Gridiron Greats Publishing and Broadcasting Network. In conjunction with Swick Enterprises, we're live from the Wallingford Connecticut home of Good Iron Greats Magazine, and I'm Bob Swick, publisher and editor of Good Iron Greats Magazine, and I'll be your host for the show. Good Iron Greats is the only publication in America which focuses upon the history and memorabilia of the North American football game since its inception in 1869. We cover 150 plus years of football history and memorabilia. You can find us on the web at GridironGreatsMagazine.com. It is at this time I'd like to introduce my co-host, who's a senior contributing writer to Gridiron Greats Magazine, a football memorabilia historian specializing in pre-World War II items, in particular Red Grange, and also Seattle Seahawk items, in particular Steve Larcher. He hails from Portland, Oregon. Mr. Joe Squire. Joe, welcome to the show. Captain, good morning, sir. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Joe. We've done it a while. I'd like to point out to all our listeners, we're recording this on Memorial Day weekend, and I would like to extend a great greeting to all United States Armed Forces veterans, including yourself, Joe, to have a very happy 
and very pleasant, peaceful Memorial Day weekend and uh, Memorial Day on Monday. You gave me goosebumps, Bob. Thank you for that. That was great. You're quite welcome, and thank you for our service to our country, Joe, and all our veteran listeners out there. It's interesting to me, um, football aside, in many cases we don't really understand the sacrifices of what of our what our veterans have gone through over the years since the inception of our country in 1776. And uh, it's something to be proud of. It's something never to forget. And I will conclude by saying freedom is not free by any way, shape, or Indeed. form or means. Now on to football. Indeed. Yep. It's been a while. Yep. I realize well, that it's off season. The Alliance of American Football went to pup. It was enjoyable watching a few spring games because I'm not really a big NBA, NHL, MLB fan. I prefer <laughs> football in its purest forms. And it's not uncommon on the TV downstairs at the compound here. That YouTube is playing some old football uh, <laughs> highlight reels, or to get me in the mood, some old USFL games that I remember quite well. But anyways, that's not what we're going to yeah, talk absolutely. about. I'm going to let you introduce what we're going to talk today's, about uh, this morning. I'm very, very excited about today's show. We have an amazing guest on, Mike Driscoll, who's a Jim Thorpe collector, <clears throat> like myself, a avid Jim Thorpe collector puts my collection to shame, so we're excited to talk about him. Uh, this morning we got some emails of some pictures or some pictures of some of the items in his collection, and uh, it's pretty amazing, I, I must say. But the topic that I'm really, really excited about is uh, we all know in this hobby there are legends. There's some myths, there's some folklore. It's like I heard this story once about Dick Butkus kicking an extra point uh, in his last professional game, and Joe Theismann held the football. True or not, it's a pretty damn good story. I'm going to have to look that one up one of these days. On this Very show, true. we've heard whispers, allegations, innuendos, hints. And what we're going to talk about today is one of those legends, those myths. It's the captain's football notebook. In various shows, we've heard Bob we've heard Bob talk about this, where he's like, "I'll have to check my notebook on that. I've got notes on that. I remember seeing that at a show and taking notes down." So for the past week, Bob and I have been exchanging texts and emails, where I'm asking him questions about this this urban myth. Our own ambassador of football, Bob Swick, the Jefferson Burdick of football cataloging. At one point, I even asked him, I'm like, you know, in, in the 80s when you were looking at these, did you take sketches of this stuff or did you take pictures? It was kind of interesting. And then Bob capped it off sending me some pictures of his collection and it's something to to behold. I'm going to try and get permission to post one picture up on our social media a little later. But uh, kind of cool. Uh, Bob uh, Bob's notebooks go back to the 80s, he, uh, let's, let me see here, he, uh, most of us who collect, collected as a kid, and then at some point discovered girls, and then we go away to college or trade school or whatever it is, and then at some point, something brings us back to the hobby, uh, that's, that's my case, and uh, Bob's a little different, we all know that in 1965, Bob bought his first pack with his father's nickel of 1965 Philadelphia, and then he moved on to Tops. I believe it. I have that backwards, Bob. Which was your yeah, first was pack, top. Philly or Tops? Yeah. It was it was Tops first, then the Phillies, and uh, so it was memories etched in my mind forever. Opening those packs. So, so in ni- 1965, were a young mustachioed Bob Swick's first uh, packs, his first brush with football as a collection. Uh, and then Bob mentioned he started taking notes in 1976 when he started writing down as much as, uh, as much as he could when he would discover things at shows. 
and then he started his notes in 1987. So a nine-year gap there where, you know, where Bob was collecting. And I asked him, I said, you have a 22-year gap. Uh, uh, you have a 22-year gap from uh, 65 to 87 when you started, you know, writing stuff down. Were you out of the hobby? And his reply was, no, I was always in the hobby. I just started taking notes in 1986. Bob, can you describe one of your notebooks that you sent me some pictures of, please? And it's everything um, you would imagine to our uh, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> well, the notebooks encompass several ideas in my mind. And again, not really knowing if there was a right way or yep. wrong way of doing things. I've always been the type to write yep. things down. Um, I have list upon list um, for things to do. And... Um, Brenda's impressed with my organizational skills to a certain degree. She's also so amazed by the amount of lists list I keep. So anyways, back then, uh, I started writing down how much I was spending when I would go to a show or if I bought a wax box. Now, traditionally, wax boxes way back when went wholesale from anywhere from like 8 to 10 I'm sorry, $8 to roughly ten eighty or $11 a box. So if I bought a box like at a candy store wholesale, I would write down what I what I paid for. If I went to a show and I sent you a an example of a show in nineteen eighty seven that I went to, I I yep. spent eight bucks at the show. I bought ten packs of nineteen eighty three uh tops football wax at thirty cents a pack. And I kinda remember the guy had them in in the rest of the box and he just wanted to get rid of them, so he said, Give me three dollars for the packs. I do not know if he gave me the box or not. And then another guy had a cheese box, my infamous cheese box purchases that were well known over the years. Uh, he had a box of, I believe, 524 cards. And at that time, I would break down the box and see what was in it. And I would write down what cards were from what years. That box was mainly 1976 Tops football. There wasn't anything really exceptional in the box. Uh, there were no Peyton rookies or anything like that. So, uh, But again, getting and cards at a penny apiece. Uh, were, were, yep. you know, a pretty good deal to say the least. So anyways, um, you know, over the years I wrote down everything I bought and sold over the years. If I found something at a show and it wasn't in my Beckett book at the time and I'm looking and I showed you one of yep. my my earliest books you that I had. <laughs> your that I your only hands up on. Beckett book. <laughs> yeah, and um, I sent you the picture of what the Mayos were going for. I knew you would have a good laugh I on that one. <laughs> the description of so the I anonymous mean, uh, in that, where it's like, the, yeah, the description of the anonymous in that Beckett book was pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, I, so um, uh, if 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 the there's card one, or there's, the, there's the, one the, notebook. Oh, sorry, go go ahead, Bob. But you know, just summarize if I if I couldn't find it in the book, I would write write notes on it and right try ahead. to figure out what it was, so on and so forth. So. Yeah. There was one uh, notebook you sent me a snapshot of, and it was a, a summary. And I asked Bob at one point, I'm like, do you keep this in Excel spreadsheet or Word doc? Uh, and he's like, no, I prefer handwritten, just like he just said a moment ago. Uh, so I asked him for some pictures of some of these fabled legends notebooks. And, and again, this is the ambassador of football. This gentleman that I'm speaking to has been a collector since 1965, since well before I was born. And we're talking hobby. This this is you. You are our captain. Uh, you had you had notes on what you'd spent collecting each set, and I went through and did yep. a quick tally. And on the 1948 Leaf was your number one, the the highest price set that you spent money on, followed by the Bowman, uh, 48 Bowman, 52 Bowman, and 63 Fleer. I found it odd that you had to spend that much money on Fleer. Those four sets comprised one-fifth of everything you've ever spent on football. Why was the 63 Correct. Fleer so expensive? Well, again, when I bought some of these cards, obviously cards came out of – football cards came out of the woodwork with the explosion of 1989. And then I decided in earnest back in 87, I really would like to complete a lot of these sets that I had like a handful of cards from. So I unfortunately, and again, this was pre-internet days, I unfortunately paid overpaid on a lot of cards, 
because I just wouldn't uh, find them. I couldn't see them, you know, that type of thing. And that's why that whole price uh, sheet that I sent you is skewed toward those cards. My 48 leaf set is anywhere from beyond poor to near mint with miscuts, writing on cards, so on and so forth. Uh, for what I paid for that set, that is not a good value for that set. But at the time, not being able to find the high numbers, I really overpaid for the high numbers, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I got and it. I overpaid, I overpaid for the 63 Fleurs at the same time. However, my 63 Fleur set is in very, very nice shape. There's only a couple cards that need upgrading. That's basically a near-mint set. Uh, 50, 48 Bowman was brutal because of the, um, the, the cards ending in three. Uh, couldn't find those, overpaid for those, so yep. on and so forth. The same thing with that other Bowman set. But, uh, again, I got a lot of other sets Bowman, there yeah. that there's minimal amount of money put into them, and they are yep. obviously, in theory, worth more than what I had into them. Speaking but, uh, of, again, that's, speaking, of that, speaking of minimal, and I noticed you spent $31 on your 77 top set, and you got to figure about 25 of that's on the Steve Largent card. <laughs> It, it it was I I, I did want a, a nice <laughs> condition large for that set, but I got to tell you a story about that seventy seven set. I obviously bought packs and I was putting it together, and I was at a show and I did I did get a chance to look it up. I was at a show in the uh, time frame of the mid eighties, and I bought the set for thirty one dollars. So that's why I have it there. Wow. And I, I know I, I put together another 77 cent. I, I sold it or traded it over the years. Um, I needed like a hundred cards from that set. So uh, that was a good observation on your part. The, the, the favorite picture that you sent me was one with uh, a shelf of yours with all of your binders, <clears throat> your, with all of your, you know, your, your pocketed binders. Uh, bottom yep. shelf, 1970 to 1979 binders with all football, and then up top, it's 80 to 88. And then leaning in front yep. of it, Walker, uh, uh, Packer Walker Cleaner Bo Melinda, just leaning up against yep. it. Is that your, is that your your type, uh, your your type from the set that you uh, you yeah. like to look at every day? Yeah, that the I I have a couple of type Packer pieces that I do keep on display at all times. And on that same shelf, if you go to the tippy top of the shelf, I have a little Packers uh, all books. paperback yep. library there that I've I've kept over the years. All books. That's those those pictures are out of my man cave, um, and uh, I do have some of my um, excess inventory in there. I also have it in, in the garage here at the compound. But anyways, I I do pull out those binders and I look at them. Uh, you know, on a regular basis, I do enjoy you know spending an evening. I'll I'll take an error. I'll go through them. Obviously, my favorite yep. error is sixty to sixty nine. Looking through them and seeing what I have there and the like. Yep, it's just it's very fun to look at how someone collects and organizes. And uh, it was just it was incredibly insightful to hear to to, to see the ambassador's collection. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to send you off something that uh, I'm going to send you off a nice signed Steve Large rookie card. And I'd be honored if you would place it on that shelf as a gentle reminder to your friend on the West Coast. I will. <laughs> I, will. I will. I'll put it with my other autographed football pieces that I have. And I do keep any of them that, uh, that I have. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you a, a real quick story just as an aside. As we know, Forrest Gregg passed away recently. And um, I was able to get his uh, ending, one of his uh, last autographs on a print, a uh, beautiful print. And uh, you could tell Forrest was aging and he was not in great shape. But I, I, I treasure all my autographs of football players, especially those uh, who played in different eras than what we have today. But anyways, uh, I will be honored, Joe, to get Outstanding. Um, Steve Large. <laughs> All right, we're all about we're we're about ready to move on. Um, again, we could take this up at a later time too. We can we can always talk I, about my different items. But uh, the notebook reference, I have about sixteen notebooks. Um, they're battered and beat or beat, beaten up to a large degree. 
but uh, there's a lot of information in there, and it's it's fun to go back and, and look at them. And again, when I was writing for Sports Collectors Digest years ago, I would yep. I would take any notes for an article and write them in my notebook. When I did my newsletter, Football Times, back in the '90s, I did the same exact thing. And uh, in the move, when we moved here almost 10 years ago, I uh, did get rid of some stuff. Um, and, again, you, you know, you just can't keep every scrap of paper, every conceivable yep. piece. You know what I mean? So I kind of condensed a yep. lot of stuff to what I thought was the most relevant of anything. I mean, I, I was bad. I mean, I was keeping the envelope of the letter that I received from Sport, Sports Collectors <laughs> Digest of whatever the correspondence was with, with date stamps on it and the like. So that was a little over <laughs> over above. But yeah, that is. In any event, I'd like to welcome our special guest who we've announced already. He has an incredible historical collection of Jim Thorpe cards and memorabilia items. He hails from Oklahoma. And I'd like to welcome to our show Mr. Michael Driscoll. Mike, welcome to the show. Hello, Captain and Joe. Uh, I want to thank you for inviting me, and I'm really humbled to be invited to visit with you guys. I've put this collection together by sitting on the couch through eBay and online. <laughs> and well, we don't have shows in Oklahoma, and uh, the uh, time constraints of living life and yep. coaching and teaching and uh, raising families. Just uh, just don't get to travel to uh, go meet guys like you and uh, and uh, other collectors in the hobby. And uh, I ended up meeting a, a fellow here, uh, uh, Robert Newman, who was a longtime uh Collector and then set up at Nationals before, and uh, I showed him part of my collection. He said, "You, you need to uh, let other people uh, see see these items and and share them with the in hobby. Uh, there will be people out there really appreciate it." And so uh, that's when I reached out to. Uh, actually, it was on Net Fifty Four and uh, uh, Carl Carl Lamdola. Mm. Helped me get set up. Uh, I did. I don't know much about uh, computers, and he helped me uh, get set up where I could start posting. And then uh, Jeff Jeffrey uh, kind of hijacked me off of there to uh, the uh, yes. <laughs> to the football forum, vintage uh, book, uh, forum, and uh, yep. He, uh, I appreciate him uh, staying on me for several months to. Uh, uh, get me uh, signed up over there, and uh, I've, gosh, I've got we to uh, meet a lot of we people. We appreciate you. Yeah, well, we appreciate you, know, you posting. We appreciate you sharing your amazing collection. Uh, seriously, Mike, it, it's you have an amazing collection. You know, off, off script a bit. I, I over the years have seen, and I've, I've been really blessed to see some amazing, amazing collections that just blow me away and mike i just gotta say i'm 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 gonna go ahead and then go back you know the email you sent uh yesterday on on your top items i i I was just i must have stared at it for about 20 minutes and and i'm saying to myself the history that's there is just is just truly unbelievable to me and again i i i've gone after nights at the national I've driven with guys who showed me their collections and their homes, you know, almost like a fortress I'm walking into. And, and I'm, I'm just floored by what I see and what's out there. And, you know, you don't need to go to the Pro Football Hall of Fame to have a Hall of Fame collection. So I'm going to start out by asking you, Mike, how did, how did you start collecting Jim Thorpe items? Well, I think it began when the seed was planted in my childhood. While living on a 160 acre property, my dad was a history mm. buff and a reading teacher and uh, collected virtually anything from the past. And around 1970, he brought home Jim Thorpe, Indian athlete by Guernsey Van Riper. 
from the school library, and he told me who Thorpe was and that he grew up just 30 miles west of us. I was in Okemo, Oklahoma, and, uh, and Thorpe grew up around Prague, Oklahoma. And so I read that book, and I I actually, in my mind, became Jim Thorpe while fishing and hunting out on that property. Wow. And uh, we uh, have a childhood idol. And we eventually moved to a town, and this, that's when I discovered football and baseball and basketball cards were out there in second grade. So, so I collected until high school, and then just like uh, you were talking about, I stepped away until the early 2000s when I started uh, getting the early. And I was so far behind in collecting cards from when I'd stopped that I just couldn't decide what to collect. Well, I then discovered eBay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I came upon a Thorpe Grange material card, the very first uh, Thorpe and Grange card that was uh, made, and I immediately knew what I wanted to play. Uh, this childhood. What do you mean by a material card? card? What do you mean a material card? Like the relic cards. No. Oh, I the relic cards. Got it. Rail cards uh, where they uh, cut up um, game used material, yeah, yeah. and then for you yep. know, unfortunately they cut up some of uh, Thorpe's uh, items, which is you know to me a travesty. But th- that's a whole different story there, and uh, so. I started uh, amassing a uh, card collection and ended up with 485 of the Thorpe Relic cards before I put on the brakes. And, wow. Uh, yeah. Mm. Holy mackerel. Yeah. Then uh, that, that led me to pur- purchasing a uh, PSA 8 in the Sport Kings and 55 All-American and a 1922 Z-Nuts and a 1916 uh, PSA 3 Famous and Bar. And that led me to start branching out a few And I think, uh, Joe, you've probably seen that Type 1 photo of the 1911 Carlisle team I used to have and ended up needing yep. to sell. And uh, then uh, my favorite piece of all that I'll talk about later it was a, a big chief writing tablet given to Thorpe when he enrolled in Carlisle in 1904. And uh, I I'm, I missed out on his uh, wool blanket from uh, Carlisle. I mean, virtually by probably 15 seconds on eBay. It, I saw it and started buying it. And when I clicked to buy it, it was bought. So, uh, what year did, what year did you discover eBay? Uh, when, when did you start circling back in the hobby? 2003, probably. 2004. Okay. You rattled off some pretty damn good cards there, Mike. Uh, the, the PSA <laughs> Sports King, Jim Thorpe, uh, 55 Tops All American, the 1916 M101 Sports Bar. I mean, just, you've got some, uh, uh, not not to mention the, you know, the, uh, the, the Z nut with him as a Portland beaver. He's dressed up as a. Yeah. Portland, Oregon beaver in that photo of all things. So that's a beautiful card. Uh, I like it. Yeah, those are some pretty impressive finally, cards in your collection. Well, thank you. Um, when I finally realized that I had a sickness and couldn't buy every Thorpe material card in existence, <laughs> I started throwing them off. Yeah. You know, sometimes you think you can get it all, and then you realize you can't. Yeah. And uh, so I, I sold 465 of them and kept just uh, the more elite cards of, of it. And uh, I decided I wanted to refocus my collection towards Thorpe memorabilia, photos, and items re- relating to the 1912 Olympics. You know, I, I do still nice. collect and feel like I and a couple of other Thorpe card collectors helped create a market for the modern Thorpe cards after being in uh, the July 2005 and May June 2007 Be- Beckett football magazines about our uh, card collection and the 
after that, the Thorpe material price really shot up, and that's especially when I realized uh, I, I can't get them all. And and then uh, a huge modern common Thorpe card started being produced. When Week three probably owned 85% of the Thorpe Relic cards at one time. And uh, mm. no longer, of course, I sold most of mine. And I do believe we helped create an interest in Thorpe again. There are probably... At the time, there were probably 20 Thorpe cards before the material cards came out. Now there are over 1,000 common and material cards. Yeah. And I only own over 600 different ones. Now, I know you sound I like me one. when I was uh, – you, you sound like me when I was trying to buy every Steve Larger rookie card that hit eBay. And that was before <laughs> PayPal, so I had to run, you know, send checks off and everything. Whenever, uh, whenever people ask me why I collect – you know, Jim Thorpe or Red Grange, my, re- my reply is always the same. It's because they deserve it. Uh, these are people who, you know, paved the way for modern football. And uh, sure. quite frankly, they des- they deserve to be recognized and to be and for someone in today in, in today's time to shine a light on them and what they accomplished. So, I don't know. Uh, you, you rattled off quite a few things just now, and you sent us an email yesterday with some – Quite frankly, like Bob said, some incredibly impressive pictures. And I did the same thing. I scrolled through there, zooming in, looking at things. Well, can you give us a recap of the of the top five items or top five or six items in your collection that you sent us some photos of? Oh, yeah. The, and, you know, in anybody's collection, uh, it's always hard to uh, cut those out. You know, you got to, <clears throat> for me, and especially something like Thorpe, there's just not as much material and items to buy out there. So any vintage item you get, it's almost like, uh, now this is my favorite. And so all my postcards, you know, didn't make it. And uh, the photos of where he went to school as a boy, as uh, as a six through nine-year-old, I've got original photos of uh, that place, an Indian school here in Oklahoma. And all my type one photos and there's a, Tony Island arcade card that uh, Jeff Jeff Payne said he's never seen one, and that as far as he knows, it's the only one out there that has has appeared. And then, uh, you know, t- the, I've got a train crate uh, from his Rain football days that belonged to him that, that didn't make the top six, and a couple recent purchases, one that uh, – Joe uh, really liked and sent sent me a nice little uh, um, friendly <laughs> e- email about. Uh, I know he liked it very a whole lot. And it, it was a postcard that nobody had ever seen. You know that didn't make it in uh, a scrapbook that I recently picked up that, of uh, the homecoming of Thorpe Tawana Tawana and Warner. They didn't make it. Now, someday those might, but they're just so recent that uh, they haven't, in my mind, moved up into that top five or six. So get, getting to what I pared down to, uh, the 1921 ATFA Cleveland Tigers football ticket stuff, it's, uh, yeah. it's uh, being uh, put into a slab by TSA. And probably could say Cleveland Indians because in 21 the, the Tigers changed their, na- their name to the Indians. Uh, it, it was kind of a... Like, it, like PSA doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm finding that out. <laughs> it, it, everything everything uh, been on the forums and stuff kind of starts to start well, is this something that uh, they're being true, you know? So, but anyway, in 21, uh, Cleveland Tigers and Cleveland Indians. Cleveland Mike, Indians you're, you're breaking up a little. You're breaking okay. up a little bit. Can you uh, can you find a spot where, where okay. you can get cell phone? Okay. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, that's better. All right, keep on going. Yeah, you're just you're just keep talking about your your Cleveland Indian ticket. Okay, and 
So it, it probably should say Cleveland Indians, but that's neither here nor there. It was, um, I think it was first appeared in Leland's auction, and then uh, I purchased it when it showed up in the Heritage auction. And I think uh, it may be the one of the earliest t- tickets out there, uh, according to Mike Moran. It's the earliest he's seen, and that he hasn't even seen a 1920 ticket. And I figure he's probably seen a whole whole lot of uh, memorabilia. And when he made that statement, you know, I, I kind of realized that I had a pretty significant uh, ticket stub in that particular uh, Living Tigers ticket stub. Interesting. What else? Keep 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 talking about the items you sent us. There was a a land grant from the Secretary of the Interior that really caught my eye. When you when you talk about rare, and Bob and I have tried to define this before, where it's like there's rare, there's unique, and then there's one of a kind. That letter to me was one of a kind. Sure, um, I got that. It, it sold originally in Heritage Auctions with uh, his one of his marriage certificates and divorce decree and uh, a movie contract. And shortly after that, it, it appeared on eBay through uh, uh, Alan Swain in uh, Van Buren, Arkansas. And it's it's definitely uh, I don't know if I could ever kick that one out of my top five. It's it's something that I think is pretty special, and it's also describe uh, it describe it for our listeners because uh, Bob and okay. I've had the advantage of, of seeing it. Yeah, sure. It's uh, it's from the Department of the Interior, United States Indian Service, and it says I enclose herewith fee simple patent for and then it describes the land that's being deeded to him east of the Indian Meridian, Oklahoma, containing 160 acres. So he's getting his 160-acre allotment. Then for for arrow, purse, and emblem of citizenship are being forwarded under separate coverage. The secretary requests that you keep the arrow always. It will be to you a symbol of your noble race, and the price you feel, and the pride that you come from the first of all Americans. The purse will always say to you that the money you gain from your labor must be wisely kept. The emblem of citizenship is to be worn in this buttonhole of your coat. Wear this badge always, and may the eagle that is on it never see you do aught of which the flag will not be proud. Wishing you success in your future undertakings. Uh, I am very sincerely Horace J. Johnson. This is December 15th, 1916. Was, was, was 160 acres given to every Indian, or did Thorpe do something special to get 160 no, acres? It was, you know? it was part of the Indian allotment trying to protect the uh, um, Indians' personal land that. Um, and give them some, uh, try to create a uh, white society for them when, before they uh, did the land runs in Oklahoma. And, and you live in Oklahoma. The, uh, Have you ever looked up where that 160 acres is that was given to Thorpe and then seen who's still, who, who owns it now? You know, I, I've looked at it on a, uh, Online and uh, but of where it was, but I've never looked to see whether he still owns it. Now mm-hmm. I know he sold his uh, mineral rights because to the land because I have that document also. <laughs> wow. wow, unbelievable! You had a you also uh, had the- you had a passenger. Oh, go ahead, Captain. (laughs) 
you had a passenger list from the uh, Finland. And uh, from yeah. previous uh, emails with you and I, I know that the Finland <clears throat> was the ship that took Jim Thorpe to the 1912 Olympics. Because uh, I, I have a picture of him on that ship. And I'd narrowed yeah. down from the time frame that that was the only time he was ever on a ship. And then you chimed in with, yes, it was the Finland, which I thought was a really cool way to put a bow on one, a piece in my collection. Tell us about that and how you got that. Okay. And, and actually, you know, he, he did go on the 1913 tour with the Chicago White, White Sox and New York Giants. And so, he was on ship then, and then in 1945 ah. he was on a merchant marine ship. But that that definitely picks that picture is definitely on when he was on the SS Finland. And it, it just on top it uh, has a uh, flag with a red star, which is the emblem of the Red Star Line, and it's on front. It says the Red Star Line SS Finland passenger list. <clears throat> And then I give it just list everybody who was on on the ship, and including I, a young lieutenant. Yes, um, there was George S. Patton, Lieutenant George S. Patton, who uh, was in the uh, modern pentathlon, and uh, I, I also highlighted. Uh, Eugene Leroy Mercer, a lot of people don't know who he is, but he was a three-time All-American for the University of Pennsylvania fullback. And only only high school boy in history to clear 12 foot with a, a spruce pole. He was fifth in the long jump at the 1912 Olympics and sixth in the decathlon and is in the College Hall wow. of Fame. And of course, you have Lewis Swanman, James Thorpe, and Glenn Warner, and James Sullivan. Yep. And then there's uh, James Manal, who Amos Alonzo Stagg at Chicago coached. And he was fifth in the pentathlon and ended up getting hurt in the pentathlon and didn't get to compete in the decathlon. But what's interesting about him is that in the Central Region Trials, Back in 1912, they did not have just one Olympic trials. They had several Olympic trials, and he was, he competed in the central one, and he placed first in the decathlon. But the AAU scored by total sum of its placings instead of the newly established scoring tables. It wasn't until 1987 that when they went went back and rescored it, it was discovered that he had actually broken the world record in it. <laughs> and so wow. the world record yeah, the world record that Thor broke in the Olympics they thought belonged to Martin Sheridan, but actually would have belonged to James Austin Manal. Wow. What's the date on that? The- uh, that ship, uh, that ship sailed right June of twelve of nineteen twelve, right? Or do you, do you have the exact yeah. date? Yeah. Um, and 14th. what I love, June fourteenth. And what I love to put things in perspective is uh, there's another famous Red Star ship that it, in <laughs> you know in April of nineteen twelve was coming the other way. That, yeah. uh that's, yeah, the Titanic that sank. So, I mean, just think of the history involved in this because sometimes I have a hard time wrapping my my arms around when things happen in history, you know, linearly. And the Titanic seems so long ago, but Jim Thorpe doesn't sometimes. And uh, sure. it's, yeah, you, you know, whatever, two months before Jim, Shor- Jim Thorpe jumps on a ship to head this, you know, to Stockholm, the Titanic, you know, sinks. It kind of makes you wonder what they were thinking of when they got on the ship, knowing that yeah. a big old ship like this just uh, sank, even one bigger than this. Yeah, exactly. Amazing. Then, you also uh, have that. Uh, go ahead. 
They also had that Carlisle presentation uh, folder from 1908. Tell, tell us about yeah. that, too, Okay. If, uh, now, I understand Carlisle, actually, a lot of people think they were in college, but they actually just had a curriculum through high school. And uh, if they wanted a college curriculum, they had to go over to Dickinson College. And so the athletic program was actually separate. It's an association. And this program was a, is a 1909 program that is honoring the 1908 season. And so there's pictures in it there of uh, Joseph Libby, who was the captain of the football team, Mike Balenci, who was a uh, baseball captain, and Thorpe at the time was a track captain. He was not a, the uh, football player yet. So he was still, I think, a third third team All-American, but he wasn't the uh, how, how he was right. later on in life. And it, it shows uh, track photos team photos and cross-country photos and shows the uh, uh, who they played in football and baseball and and uh, lacrosse and track and, and the scoring that was involved. Also ha- has the, uh, the track meet records for the school listed. All the C award, w- award winners and the uh, order of events, the school song and yell, and uh, photos of uh, Moses Freeman, who was the superintendent, and also of Warner. That's a, it's an amazing folder. I mean, the, the history of that is just incredible. Yeah, you know, I've I've seen uh, three 1912 programs like this. This is the only one I've seen of uh, the no late, but I've heard there is another one out there. I'm sure there's some others that people just haven't shown, just like you know, I'm just now showing my collection. But I would think the 1908 one might be a little bit harder to find than the 1912 one. Right. Um, kind, kind of up a little. Do you, are you actually looking for anything on your want list at this time, Mike, as far as uh, filling in any gaps or anything like that? I mean, it, it sounds like you got a, a lot of different things that all relate to one another, and, and obviously uh, many, you know, pieces that, you know, encompass this track and field career, so on and so forth. But do you have anything on your want list you're looking for? Oh, you know, if I, call it, if I could get Joe's 1907 – Thorpe and Grease uh, postcard and his, uh, his uh, 1907 football postcard and Jeff's cabinet photo <laughs> and his Olympic photo of Thorpe Tuanama and Sockley's. I'd probably just quit collecting and go on into the sunset. No. Yeah. Actually, there are, I've got a list of over 100 items that. Um, I'm still looking for. Um, well, I don't have, you know, there's a, I would love to get a uh, a ticket of his last football game when he uh, mm. came out of retirement and uh, played for Chicago and went one more time. Chicago uh, Cardinals. Yep. Get, Put him on his uh, their uh, roster, and they played the Chicago Bears. And then uh, May second, nineteen seventeen ticket is maybe probably going to be out of my price range, but who knows? You know, uh, that's when the double no hitter of Fred Tony and Jim Hippo gone. Right. He was uh, he uh, knocked in the winning run in in the tenth inning. Mike, did I? Uh... Did I ever tell you I have a I have a ticket from the Stockholm Olympics of the day he won uh, the decathlon? I, I've seen your tickets. I, I think you and I've 
maybe uh, talk before. I've got the first two days. You know, it's a three-day okay. event. Yeah, three I've days. I've got the yes. first two days, and you've got the uh, third day. The third day. And, uh, and you've uh, got that, that, that. The Hectathlon was a one-day yeah. event, and I've got the, a ticket from that as yeah. well. Yes, I love that. And I've got an inauguration ticket and a um, opening ceremonies and when he did the long jump. Mm. So I think you've got the tickets I don't have, and I've got the tickets you don't have of all these significant <laughs> days. We're like, you and I are like That's Voltron, Mike. Like if we formed together, we'd, we'd, we'd be a super collector. <laughs> uh, what are some, uh, what are some in, interesting stories, uh, you know, of your collecting? Like, I mean, you know, bumping into a relative, or I mean, just you, living in Oklahoma, you're so close to the flame. I mean, it's it just, it's got to be a lot easier for you to, you know, check up on a lot of that history. Sure. Uh, and I did get to uh, visit one of his relatives, uh, a granddaughter mm-hmm. in Yale, Oklahoma, where his, his, uh, ho- the only home he ever bought is, is a museum there in Yale, Oklahoma. It's about a, an hour and a half east of me. And, uh, she, uh, I took my collection over there, and they called her over, and she invited me to oh, her wow. home. And, I, and I'm looking around, and uh, just like we have grandparents' pictures on the wall, she had grandparents' pictures on the wall. <laughs> and I'm staring at Jim Thorpe all over the wall. You know, original. <laughs> it's wild, but probably uh, the one that uh, is frustrating me the most is, but also. I'm grateful to have um, been able to get to know this guy. Uh, and actually, he lives in Portland, Oregon, Joe. Uh, Sean Hughes. He, uh, I don't know him. He's, you know him? No, I don't. What's his last name? Oh, okay. Well, Sean Hughes. What's he's the great, Hughes? great son of Henry Rose Cloud. And Henry Rose Cloud had left all of his belongings to him and that that can be verified on which uh, on the internet. His grandma's dad was in the old house who was a friend of Jim Thorpe's. Henry's wife was Elizabeth Bender, who was Charles Albert Bender's sister. Uh, baseball Hall of Fame. She taught at Carlisle in nineteen fifteen and sixteen. And I purchased a pair of X bikes from Sean Hughes who through the oral history of his family, they they were traded to him from Jim Thorpe through Charles Bender. He gave him a baseball glove. And we know athletes do that all the time. Yep. He, uh, Henry Rose Cloud was the superintendent of Haskell. He was in the office. He was the uh, director of the office of Indian Affairs, ordained Presbyterian minister. And I, I found documentation where Thorpe actually started uh, practicing as a Presbyterian in the 1930s. And I'm wondering if it was through the influence of Henry Rowe Cloud. And Henry Rowe Cloud was also superintendent of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, which you may be familiar with, Joe. I am. And yes, sir. So, through the world history, these track spikes were supposed to belong to Jim Thorpe and were and were traded. And you know, we know that all of his football items have been, maybe not all of his football items, but we know many of his football and track items have been found and and. But his track is he bought after the Olympics because, you know, he lost his regular shoes or stolen at the Olympics. Yep. And then yep. photos of him after the Olympics in track spots. So he either borrowed some more or or uh, bought some, but they've never surfaced. Now, I've not been able to get these documented, but there's a possibility that through that family, I, I purchased Jim Thorpe's spikes, track spikes, knowing for sure and 
how that's ever, ever going to be able to be authenticated, I don't know, but I'm trying. So that's probably my most okay. interesting collecting story. I like that. I mean, sometimes it's those those myths are better. Where it's like I heard these are Jim Thorpe spikes. You know, that's that's good enough for me, man. That's amazing. You know, truly, truly you, amazing. And Mike, we're almost the, out of time. Okay. Um, I want to I want to ask you one more question for a comment. You got any beginning advice for any collectors? Yeah, I would say to decide what you want to collect and what what your focus is going to be and stick to a budget best you can. If you see anything that looks really unique or you've never seen before, try your best to get it. And don't take a long break. You know, you, you hear so many people, well, I got out of it for 20 or 25 years. If you could limit that to, you know, shorter periods of time, then you're not going to miss out on uh, some uh, amazing things possibly if you'll just yeah. limit. Find some way. To Great advice. Stay in the hobby and stay and keep adding to your collection. Mike, real quick, what do you think is the earliest picture of Jim Thorpe that exists? Oh, probably the 1907 football ones. You know, 1904 is when he enrolled into Carlisle, and that's when that that big chief tablet came about. But as far as I know. So anything from 1907 would be the, would have to be the earliest that uh, that has surfaced that I've seen. Interesting. Now I'm hoping someday that something from Haskell, when he went there in 1898 as 11 year old, I'm hoping that someday maybe a photo of him at Haskell will uh, appear. Interesting. You just never that's know. A, that would be that would be an amazing never find if it, if it comes out to the market. Wow, unbelievable, truly unbelievable. Well, Mike, we're almost out of time. I really thank you for being on the show today and sharing with our audience what has to be uh, an incredible historical collection of Jim Thorpe items and, and what an education on Thorpe. Uh, it's truly amazing. You, you are to be commended for your your diligence and your collection and, and what you have. This, 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 that's amazing to me, truly amazing. Uh, thank you, and I appreciate you having me on. And you know, uh, Don't bid too high on Thorpe, Thorpe things, please. <laughs> <laughs> I give the same advice to you, Mike. <laughs> I hear you. It's been great having you on the show, sir. Thank you very much for your time. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. All right. We're we're going to be in a limited two-minute warning and wrap-up. Joe, I'm going to hand off to you real quick. What would you learn on today's show? Best seat in the house, Captain. Uh, Just being able, like you said, being able to see and talk to people who have pretty amazing collections. But to be honest, the highlight of, uh, of, of the show for me was, the four or five days preceding the show where I, I got to, you know, talk to you about your collection and how you cata- you know, catalog things. And, you know, I just, I had a smile on my face pretty much all morning uh, <laughs> when I was getting ready for this, just, uh, just talking about it. I think we should to be continued this and uh, I'll have some follow-up questions for you. All right. That sounds good. That sounds good. I picked up on today's <laughs> show. Uh, it was, it was nice to look back in time. And where did the time go? Snap your fingers, 60 years have gone by, and just it blows my mind sometimes. Yeah. Uh, even though I don't feel like, I, I, I don't think like a 60-year-old, and I don't act like a 60-year-old, that's for sure. And then secondly, uh, putting in, in context Mike's collection, seeing that email yesterday of the items that he has, his top items, and it just was really blew me away to say the least. 
And again, I go back to saying it's, it's you know one of the nicest parts of doing what I do is viewing people's collections. And I always go back to uh, seeing Don Gree's collection of Cleveland Browns stuff. His grandfather was the original treasurer of the Browns, and going to his house at the Cleveland National at the at the end of one show was it just blew me away. I mean, as I. I, I it's just amazing to me to see what people have and what collectors have, and it's so great. And it's preservation of football history, and in Mike's case, preservation of to be one of the greatest athletes who ever walked the earth. And yep. um, what a what a story, Thorpe's story is. It's just it, it, it amazes me. It truly amazes me to to see all this stuff. It's interesting. But anyway, uh, we're, there, we're yeah. almost out of time. Oh yeah. Uh, oh sorry. Go ahead, Joe. I was going to say ESPN's come up with a show on Bo Jackson, and I watched about 10 minutes of it the other day. And I'm like, who's the greater athlete, Bo Jackson or or Jim Thorpe? I mean, if you think about it in the context of the, the time they appeared on the planet, I mean. Yep. And, you know, and, I, and I'll, go back, I'll go back to the 70s real quick. It was very uncommon. It was not uncommon for guys to play – three sports or four sports in high school. Today, because of specialization, they're lucky they play one sport, and that's it. And they're not getting a real yeah. balanced view of you know, all the different sports type of thing. So it doesn't make any sense. All right, we're out of time. Joe, thanks for being on. We'll be back. Check out our website, gridironingreatsmagazine.com. And so the next time, thanks for listening. Goodbye. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by to listen to another episode here on the Sports History Network. Our podcasters are passionate about uncovering and sharing sports stories from yesteryear. And if you didn't know it already, we have over 30 shows across the network covering all sorts of sports history topics. In fact, here's a glimpse into one of our awesome podcasts here on the network. Each week, the official Football Learning Academy podcast will take you deep into the history of pro football through interviews with players, coaches, or administrators in the NFL, as well as interviews with Pro Football Hall of Fame selectors, authors, and historians. You'll learn how the game evolved and important moments that shaped the sport into what it is today. And don't miss the Pro Football History Nugget of the Week. Listen to the official Football Learning Academy podcast on the Sports History Network. How about that? I bet you're super hyped to go listen to that new podcast, right? Well, to learn about this show and all the other podcasts on the network, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Again, that's sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash podcast. Head over there today to find your next favorite sports history podcast.